Book Ten of the Odyssey, The Grace of the Witch. Odysseus and his men next land on the island of Aeolus, the Wind King, and stay with him a month. To extend his hospitality, Aeolus gives Odysseus two parting gifts, a fair west wind blowing the ships towards Ithaca, and a great bag holding all the unfavorable stormy winds. Within sight of home and while Odysseus is sleeping, the men open the bag, thinking it contains gold and silver. The bad winds thus escape and blow the ship back to Aeolus's island. The king refuses to help them again, believing now that their voyage has been cursed by the gods. The discouraged mariners next stop briefly at the land of the Lastragones, fierce cannibals, who bombard their ships with boulders. Only Odysseus, his ship, and its crew of forty-five survived the shower of boulders. The lone ship then sails to Aea, home of the goddess Circe, considered by many to be a witch. There Odysseus divides his men into two groups. Eurelicus leads one platoon to explore the island, while Odysseus stays behind on the ship with the remaining crew. In the wild wood they found an open glade, around a smooth stone house, the Hall of Circe, and wolves and mountain lions lay there, mild in her soft spell, fed on her drug of evil. None would attack. Oh, it was strange, I tell you. But switching their long tails, they faced our men like hounds, who look up when their master comes home with tidbits for them, as he will from the table. Humbly those wolves and lions with mighty paws fawned on our men, who met their yellow eyes and feared them. In the entrance, they stayed to listen there. Inside her quiet house, they heard the goddess Circe. Lo, she sang in her beguiling voice, while on her loom she wove ambrosial fabric sheer and bright, by that craft known to the goddesses of heaven. No one would speak until Polites, most faithful and likable of my officers, said, huh, Dear friends, there's no need for stealth. Here's a young weaver singing a pretty song to set the air a tingle on these lawns and paven courts. Goddess she is, or lady? Shall we greet her? So reassured, they all cried out together, and she came swiftly to the shining doors to call them in. All but Eurelicus, who feared a snare. The innocents went after her. On the throne she seated them in lounging chairs while she prepared a meal of cheese and barley and amber honey mixed with Pramian wine, adding her own vile pinch to make them lose desire or thought of their dear fatherland. Scarce had they drunk when she flew after them with her long stick and shut them in a pigsty. Bodies, voices, heads, and bristles, all swinish now, though minds were still unchanged. So squealing in they went, and Circe tossed them acorns, mast, and cornel berries, fodder for hogs who rut and slumber on the earth. Down to the ship, Eurelicus came running to cry alarm. Foul magic doomed his men. But working with dry lips to speak a word, he could not, being so shaken. Blinding tears welled in his eyes, foreboding filled his heart. When we were frantic, questioning him, at last we heard the tale. Our friends were gone. Eurelicus tells Odysseus what has happened and begs his captain to sail away from Circe's island. Against Eurelicus's advice, however, Odysseus rushes to save his men from the enchantress. On the way, he meets the god Hermes, who gives him a magical plant called Molly to protect him from Circe's power. Still, Hermes warns Odysseus must make the goddess swear that she will play no witch's tricks. Armed with the molly and Hermes' warning, Odysseus arrives at Circe's palace. Circe welcomes him and leads him to a magnificent silver-studded chair. The lady Circe mixed me a golden cup of honeyed wine, adding in mischief her unholy drug. I drank, and the drink failed. 
But she came forward, aiming a stroke with her long stick, and whispered, Down in the sty and snore among the rest. Without a word, I drew my sharpened sword, and in one bound held it against her throat. She cried out, then slid under to take my knees, catching her breath to say in her distress, What champion of what country can you be? Where are your kinsmen in your city? Are you not sluggish with my wine? Ah, wonder, never a mortal man that drank this cup. But when it passed his lips, he had succumbed. Hail must be your heart and your tempered will. Odysseus then you are, O great contender, of whom the glittering god with golden wand spoke to me ever and foretold the black swift ship would carry you from Troy. Put up your weapon in the sheath. We too shall mingle and make love upon our bed, so mutual trust may come of play and love. To this I said, Circe, am I a boy that you should make me soft and doting now? Here in this house you turned my men to swine. Now it is I myself you hold, enticing into your chambers, to your dangerous bed, to take my manhood when you have me stripped. I mount no bed of love with you upon it. Or swear me first a great oath if I do. You'll work no more enchantment to my harm. She swore at once, outright, as I demanded, and after she had sworn and bound herself, I entered Circe's flawless bed of love. Circe's maidens bathe Odysseus and offer him a tempting meal, yet his mind remains on his captive men. Circe regarded me as I sat there disconsolate and never touched a crust. Then she stood over me and chided me. Why sit at table mute, Odysseus? Are you mistrustful of my bread and drink? Can it be treachery that you fear again, after the gods' great oath I swore for you? I turned to her at once and said, Circe, where is the captain who could bear to touch this banquet in my place? A decent man would see his company before him first. Put hard in me to eat and drink you may by freeing my companions. I must see them. But Circe had already turned away. Her long staff in her hand, she held the hall and opened up the sty. I saw her enter, driving those men turned swine to stand before me. She stroked them, each in turn, with some new chrism. And then, behold, their bristles fell away, the coarse pelts grown upon them by her drug melted away, and they were men again, younger, more handsome, and taller than before. Their eyes upon me, each one took my hands, and wild regret and longing pierced them through. So the room rang with sobs, and even Circe pitied that transformation. Exquisite the goddess looked as she stood near me, saying, Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, go to the sea beach and sea breasting ship, drag it ashore, full length upon the land, stow gear and stores in rock holes under cover, return, be quick, and bring all your dear companions. Now, being a man, I could not help consenting, so I went down to the sea beach in the ship where I found all my other men aboard, weeping in their despair along the benches. Sometimes in farmyards, when the cows return well fed from pasture to the barn, one sees the pen give way before the calves in tumult, breaking through to cluster about their mothers, bumping together, bawling. Just that way my crew poured around me when they saw me come, their faces wet with tears as they saw their homeland in the crags of Ithaca, even the very town where they were born. And weeping still, they all cried out in greeting. Prince, what joy this is! Your safe return! Now Ithaca seems here, and we in Ithaca. But tell us now what death befell our friends. And speaking gently, I replied, First we must get the ship high on the shingle and stow our, our gear in stores and clefts of rock for cover. Then come follow me to see your shipmates in the magic house of Circe, eating and drinking, endlessly regaled. 
They turned back as commanded to this work. Only one lagged and tried to hold the others. Eurelicus it was, who blurted out, Where now, poor remnants? It is the devil's work you long for. Will you go to Circe's hall? Swine, wolves, and lions shall make us all, beasts of her courtyard bound by her enchantment. Remember those cy those the Cyclops held. Remember shipmates who made that visit with Odysseus, the daring man. They died for his foolishness. When I heard this, I had mind to draw the blade that swung against my side and chop him, bowling his head upon the ground, kinsman or no kinsman, close to me, though he was. But others came between us, saying to stop me, Prince, we can just leave him if you say the word. Let him stay here on guard. As for ourselves, show us the way to Circe's magic hall. So all turned inland, leaving shore and ship in Eurelicus. He, too, came on behind, fearing the rough edge of my tongue. Meanwhile, at Circe's hands, the rest were gently bathed, anointed with sweet oil, and dressed afresh in tunics and new cloaks with fleecy linings. We found them all at supper when we came, but greeting their old friends once more, the crew could not hold back their tears, and now again the room sang with sobs. Then Circe, loveliest of all immortals, came to counsel me. Son of Laertes, the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, enough of weeping fits. I know, I too, what you have endured upon the inhumane sea, what odds you have met on land from hostile men. Remain with me and share my meat and wine. Restore behind your ribs those gallant hearts that served you in the old days when you sailed from stony Ithaca. Now parched and spent, your cruel wandering is all you think of, never of joy after so many blows. As we are men, we could not help but consenting. So day by day we lingered, feasting long on roasts and wine until a year grew fat. But when the passing months and wheeling seasons brought the lone, long summery days, the pause of summer, my shipmates one day summoned me and said, Captain, shake off this trance and think of home, if home indeed awaits us, if we shall ever see your own well-timbered hall on Ithaca. They made me feel a pang, and I agreed. That day and all day long, from dawn to sundown, we feasted on roast meat and ruddy wine, and after sunset, when the dusk came on, my men slept in the shadowy halls, but I went through the dark to Circe's flawless bed and took the goddess's knees in supplication, urging as she bent to hear, O oh, Circe, now you must keep your promise. It is time. Help make me sail for home. Day after day my longing quickens, and my company give me no peace, but wear my heart away, pleading when you are not at hand to hear. The loveliest of goddesses replied, Son of Laertes in the gods of old, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier, you shall not stay here longer against your will. But home you may not go, unless you take a strange way round and come to the cold homes of death and pale Persephone. You shall hear prophecy from the rapt shade of blind Tiresias of Thebes, forever charged with reason even among the dead. To him alone of all the flitting ghosts Persephone has given a mind undarkened. At this... I felt a weight like a stone within me, and moaning pressed my length against the bed with no desire to see daylight more. <laughs>